iceberg chart videos. You've seen them, I've seen them, I've made one, I'm making one. I found this chart on Google, I sent it in my server that nobody is allowed into, and people wanted to see me talk about it. So this is what they're getting. Well, they're not actually going to see me, because as you can see, my head is a pumpkin. This chart is about unsolved mysteries and also weird things. So really you can just say that any random fucking shit counts as viable for this iceberg, as long as it's not something normal like a loaf of bread or this Robot Heroes Atlas Destroyer figure. I'm talking about it, but as you can see, this iceberg is, uh, it's fucking huge, mate. So I'm going to be taking this bit by bit, and I'm obviously starting with the top tier, so I've got the difficult task of trying to make this video interesting while talking about crap that most of you will already know about. So let's get this started with a boring video that nobody's going to watch and nobody's going to want to see a sequel to. The Zodiac Killer. As the name suggests, the Zodiac Killer is an iconic arts and crafts paper mache salesman of the late 1370s. Now, of course, the Zodiac Killer was an unknown serial killer of 1960s California. The actual Zodiac Killer isn't known, with suspects ranging from Arthur Lay Allen and Ted Bundy, with them all ranging from possible suspects to basically completely ruled out suspects. The Zodiac Killer is known to have killed at least 5 people, but claimed himself to have killed 37. Now, not satisfied with just being a serial killer that didn't get caught, he also went the Jack the Ripper route and went out of his way to send a bunch of taunting letters with a bunch of cryptographs and ciphers, and he claimed to have been collecting slaves for the afterlife as well. And also, only two of his four ciphers have ever been cracked. I don't want to, uh, go out of my way to explain the murders myself, you can go look that up in your own time, but it's not known whether the Zodiac Killer today is dead or possibly still alive. I mean, he'd be like, what, 70 or 80 years old now anyway, but if he was alive, but, I mean, you don't know. Oh yeah, he also gave himself the name The Zodiac Killer. What does that say about him? I don't know, but it definitely says something, and it's definitely very interesting. Jack the Ripper. Look, you know who Jack the Ripper was? I mean, you, well, you don't. I mean, he's famously an unknown serial killer of 1888 London. He killed a lot of women, though, and you know that part about it. Though only five are considered the canonical victims. That phrase being one that I don't know if I've ever seen applied to... murders but there are generally believed to have been more than that, just they've never been connected. Jackie Hill was also known to perform surgical operations on his victims' corpses, and apparently cut their throats prior to doing so. He was also prone to sending letters to the police, arrogant as he was, and it's in these letters that came the name Jack the Ripper. Though the letter that coined the name is now considered to be a hoax, meaning Jack's most famous title is something that wasn't even his own idea. Now there was quite a big reaction to the news about this killer, and it resulted in things like the Whitechapel Vigilance Committee, who patrolled around looking for suspicious people, they, they didn't accomplish much. Theories are all over the place on who Jack was, whether it was one guy, one girl, or a bunch of guys, girls, or whatnot. I could sit here and talk about more about Jack the Ripper, but frankly, you know what Jack the Ripper is. D.B. Cooper. Ah oh, hey, something of an interesting one. D.B. Cooper is another unknown fella, the epithet given to a plane hijacker of 1971. Now the man actually went by the alias Dan Cooper when he bought his plane ticket, but naturally not being one to get anything right at all, the media went with D.B. Cooper. Maybe it stands for Dan Bloody Cooper or something. Now basically what this guy did was get on a plane, a Boeing 727, ordered a bourbon and coke, and shortly after departing from Portland handed a flight attendant a note. Naturally thinking this guy was some lonely horny bastard with a number she wasn't exactly chopping at the bit to read, she didn't really pay attention until he brought up that he had this neat little device called a bomb with him. After dropping a darkie in her pants, she read the note, sat down beside him, saw the bomb, and heard his demands. He wanted 200,000 negotiable American currencies, because that's how people talk, don't you know? And also four parachutes and a fuel truck in Seattle to refuel the aircraft. Apparently, man was actually a pretty decent bloke. Paid his bill, tipped his waiters, generally spoke nice, and was pretty well-mannered. Guy even asked for food to be brought out to his fellow passengers. After landing, he got his ransom, made a bunch of more demands on how to fly next, and then midway through his flight, he, he jumped out of the plane and vanished forever. A big 40 plus year investigation went on with this incident, but the man was never identified. A lot of speculation and stuff surrounds this case, and in the end it remains the only case of air piracy in commercial history to be unsolved. The Bermuda Triangle Shockingly enough, the Bermuda Triangle is a vaguely triangularly shaped section of ocean marked by the coasts of Great Antilla, the Florida Panhandle, and surprisingly, Bermuda. This site is one of complete wackiness. Allegedly, 50 ships and 20 airplanes have mysteriously vanished in this region. There are naturally a lot of theories, there are supernatural ones, and actually reasonable ones, ranging from navigation errors caused by the Agnoic Line, which is apparently a place in which magnetic compass variation has become irrelevant, or big-ass tidal waves that smash all evidence of the destroyed ships, or 
even the theory that it's not that big a deal, and there's nothing to suggest that the amount of destroyed and missing vessels are that out of the ordinary when compared to any other major location where a lot of ships and planes travel. Which makes sense, I mean the places where the most airplanes go through is likely also the place where the most airplane crashes happen. There are also claims of potential exaggeration or misinformation that has inflated the number of missing transports. But me? I want to find the most unreasonable, stupid ass, absolutely brain dead explanations. So personally, while there are fun theories of it being lost Atlantean technology, or a time-space warp hole that sucks some travelers into it and sends them into a parallel world, I have a better theory for you. Clearly, this is all the result of French occultist Eliphas Levi when he took a massive dump in the middle of a ritual that really pissed off a demon he was talking to. Dodging the demon's attempts to swing at him, the demon's momentum set it flying all the way over to this vague region of ocean. But of course, this demon I will affectionately refer to as El Grogagnim was... Well, they didn't bring his glasses on the day, he didn't know he'd need them, and now he's just been wandering around this area taking vicious thunder dumps to project our mortar weapons to take down ships on a conceptual level, just in case they're Eliphas. His bad eyesight making it impossible for him to tell the difference. I don't know about you, but to me, I think that's pretty likely. Area 51. Area 51 is the commonplace name given to, well, an area of America and Nevada officially known as Homie Airport, or more unfortunately, a Groom Lake. This facility belongs to the United States Air Force and is allegedly used as an open training range while also being extremely secretive. Naturally, this leads people to come up with the only natural explanation. Aliens. This place is just a cesspool for conspiracy theories about aliens and UFOs. Now a lot of actually interesting stuff is attested to have happened here, but let's be honest, people only give a shit about the aliens and oh boy, UFOs, alien testing, weapons programs, time travel, opening holes to hell, summoning Fiuk, the brother of El Grogonim, to bring him home. Wow, all so exciting. The most interesting thing I can say about Area 51 that people don't generally know is that there's some actual debate about where the name Area 51 itself originated from. From an Atomic Energy Commission numbering grid, a CIA document used in the Vietnam War, and so on. It's kind of interesting, right? Look, you know what Area 51 is. I'm not going to waste your time beyond what I've already wasted explaining it. When am I supposed to mention that stupid rating meme? No, mate. Bigfoot. Do I really have to... <sighs> okay. Bigfoot is a cryptid. A cryptid is a creature that is believed to exist, but generally not accepted to by mainstream science. As you might expect, this means it is believed to exist by some, but generally we all know it's a big load of bullshit. That being said, there are some cryptids that actually have turned out to be real. For instance, there was a time where the platypus was considered a cryptid, but they do exist, as long as you believe in the theory that Australia exists. I mean, the jury's still out on that one. Bigfoot, however, uh, uh, no. Bigfoot is attested to be a big, hairy, upright walking ape that lives in forests in North America. Easily the most popular and well-known cryptid, Bigfoot is known from a lot of things, such as the popular Patterson-Gimlin film from 1967 that allegedly shows footage of a female Bigfoot named Patty. Good name there, Patterson's. Real creative. Now, seeing as you already probably know a good deal about Bigfoot and I've told you nothing new, uh, how about I talk about some history that isn't often talked about? So the Sasquatch, as it's also known, is fairly similar to certain ancient mural depictions of large hairy creatures in indigenous cultures, long before the existence of contemporary Bigfoot myth. And there are many cases of this in various ancient cultures, it's also similar to an ancient creature that actually once existed, known as Gigantopithecus blackie, the largest known primate of all time that may have stood around 3 meters tall. Now we only know about Gigantopithecus from fossilized jaw remains, so a lot of it is up for speculation and argument but estimates will roughly range from 2.5 to 3.5 meters in height on average. There are also other creatures out there similar to Bigfoot that are believed to exist, such as the Yeti, which we'll talk about later, the Australian Yowie of ancient Aboriginal culture, the Yeren of the Chinese Warring States period, the Mawa of the Malaysian Orang Asli people, and your mother of contemporary modern human history. Now while popular, Bigfoot is only one of a pair of cryptids that basically any random schmuck would know, the other being the second most popular cryptid, the Loch Ness Monster. The Loch Ness Monster is a supposed creature that exists within Loch Ness in the Scotland Highlands. Attested to have existed since 1933, Nessie, as it's often nicknamed, is considered to be a long neck sea creature, most well known from the 1934 surgeon's photograph, which is of course a hoax, a fucking big fat stupid lie. Sightings supposedly include the 565 AD St. Columba one, which is probably bullshit because the year was 565, sea creatures were attested everywhere. It'd be weird if this big body of water didn't have a stupid story to it, and sightings just kept going all the way to probably today. Being a figure of pop culture, a ton of searchers have gone on trying to find and locate Nessie, and obviously, they haven't found dog shit. Now that's the basic gist of the cryptid, which you probably knew about already, but what is the Loch Ness Monster? Scientifically. 
Well, it doesn't exist, but what if it did? Supposedly, it's a type of plesiosaur. Plesiosaurs are a class of marine reptiles from the Mesozoic Era, or the time of the dinosaurs. Plesiosaurs share the family Sauropteria, with the Pliosaurs, including the famous Mosasaurus and Lyplurodon, and obviously lived underwater. Plesiosaurs are identified by having those incredibly long necks along with four flippers, and were generally decently large, with the largest being Alberta Nectes, at nearly 12 meters long. Now, plesiosaurs are very much sadly extinct, however, there are people who know how certain indigenous cultures have folklorish creatures who closely resemble what we would now know as plesiosaurs, and they use this logic to say that Nessie could exist. Now, I couldn't find any specific species of plesiosaur that actually lived in Scotland that we know of, with the closest being a bunch of different plesiosaurs that lived in England and other parts of the United Kingdoms, and Leptocletus, which lived in areas around Scotland. So is it really a plesiosaur? Probably not. Other theories to explain the various sightings of the creature include eels, misidentified treebus floating in the water, or even an elephant. My theory? I think it's just Biffweed going for a swim and lying to the cryptozoologist about it. The Roswell Incident The Roswell Incident was a 1947 event that is rife with conspiracy theories where people who have spent more money on tinfoil in a week than I earn in a month on YouTube come up with their third eye ideas on how it relates to aliens. During the flying saucer craze of 1947, rancher Mac Brazel discovered strange debris just outside of Roswell, New Mexico, including rubber, sticks, and fittingly enough, tinfoil. Not long after, he took it to the Roswell Army Airfield, who brilliantly decided to announce it was a flying disc, and thus the Roswell Daily Record went on to declare a flying saucer was found. Turns out that really, it's a fucking weather balloon, and that was that. Until 1970, where some absolute fucking goon by the name of Jesse Marcel, the Lieutenant Colonel of the US Air Force that was one of the ones accompanying the transport of the debris, was interviewed and made the claim that he thought it was extraterrestrial in origin. And then, BAM! Conspiracy theories, cover-ups, crazy ideas, people believe that a flying saucer crashed. Spontaneously, there became a bunch of eyewitnesses who didn't exist until 1970. A ton of, like, papers and books about it came around. There's the moderately well-known 1995 alien autopsy video that claims to be a reconstruction of real footage. Shit like that. Apparently, there's also the claim that just people in then high-tech radiation suits were seen by a woman and may have been mistaken as aliens because not like the common public knew about this high-tech technology. Also, the iconic grey alien archetypical design for extraterrestrials are extremely heavily associated with the Roswell incident, despite actual aliens themselves not being connected with the event until the 1980s. I'm not even going to make a guess as to what this was. I think it was just a balloon and people really wanted to be something it isn't. Elisa Lamb. The case of Elisa Lamb is one that I'm not going to particularly make many jokes about. Elisa Lamb was a Chinese Canadian student of the University of British Columbia who one day decided to go on a holiday to California. Now, Elisa was diagnosed with bipolar disorder and depression to the extent that because she was known to often not take her bipolar medication, she had several episodes of which one she was even hospitalized for as a result of. On January 26 of 2013, Elisa checked into the Cecil Hotel, assigned to a shared room, until complaints about it got her moved into her own room. However, she would go missing on the 31st of January and would not be found for a while. A big investigation went on, but the Los Angeles police couldn't find her. Then, on February 13th, came the infamous elevator video, a really strange two and a half minute long video recorded by the Cecil Hotel's elevator camera, showing Lisa behaving really strangely, pressing all the buttons on the elevator, going in and out of it at random moments, and eventually leaving it entirely and never returning. Six days later, as a result of complaints about weird watercolor and taste, one of the hotel maintenance workers who would find her dead body floating in one of the hotel's four water tanks. The strange circumstances of Elisa's death and the strange elevator view have resulted in a lot of theories, both reasonable ones trying to explain how she got onto the roof into a giant water tank that had a cover, and crazy conspiracy theories. A lot of factors have gone into this case. How'd she get into the tank? How'd she get to the roof? How did nobody see her? Was foul play involved? Was she killed? Did she commit suicide? Was she having an episode? Or, of course, because her rationality is overrated, was she performing some ridiculous elevator ritual? Now, there's even more there to talk about. Why didn't the police search dogs and notice her when they explored the roof given the lid was off and so on? And the generally believed theory by people who don't believe in occultist nonsense is that Elisa Lamb forgot her meds again, had a really, really bad episode, and as a result went through the fire escape onto the roof and jumped into the water tank where she accidentally drowned. It's a really sad story, and while a mysterious case indeed, it's one that I think can be over-sensationalized to the point where people seem to forget that this isn't some supernatural horror movie, but the actual death of a real person that occurred as recently as 2013. Mothman. <laughs> what the hell happened to my voice? Mothman. Okay, one that isn't as heavy. Mothman is another cryptid, and arguably another of the most popular and well-known. It isn't, it isn't the top tier after all. 
1966 in West Virginia, people claim to have seen a headless man with wings and big glowing red eyes where the nipples should be, flying off into the sky. Sightings of the Mothman will continue to occur for a while, most notably associated with the idea that Mothman will often appear before a big tragedy, including the collapse of the London Bridge, but that's not the right one, including the collapse of the Silver Bridge, and the Russian apartment bombings of 1999. Now, Mothman is a pretty huge figure with festivals and statues built in his honor. There's a 2002 film I never have and never will bother to watch, and a ton of people probably dressing up as the guy walking around and I just hoping they'll get spotted by someone who shit their pants and report on it. As much as there are people who will theorize that Mothman is an alien, there are also people who believe it's, it's just an owl, which seems likely enough. Well, sometimes even just random things that we mistakenly see as a humanoid figure, which is an effect called pareidolia, I believe. Also, it's believed that his name comes from both Batman and his villain Killer Moth, which would it certainly explain why a creature initially described with bird wings is being called Mothman. Malaysian Airline Flight's 370 Disappearance On March 8, 2014, a plane scheduled for flight from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia Is that how you pronounce it? I don't know. A plane scheduled for flight from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia to Beijing mysteriously vanished, with 227 passengers never to be heard from again. Every attempt to message the flight got no response, and after it missed its scheduled landing, it was declared missing. But would follow be one of the most expensive missing plane searches in aviation history, fittingly as it's one of the deadliest ever incidents involving a Boeing 777. Now this event is still really mysterious, with apparently the flight having deviated massively from its scheduled course, and a lot of things went on that identified the likely area in which the plane's final transmission came from being just off the edge of Australia. After weeks, months, and eventually over a year of searching, evidence has showed up on the island of Reunion that basically proved the location of the flight's crash with a piece of it floating onto a beach, and lots of following bits of debris relating to the flight would later be found after that too. Now the big thing obvious with this flight is the mystery. We still don't know what exactly happened, and as a result there's a ton of theories, ranging from the plane being hijacked, terrorist attacks, North Korea, the crew suiciding, the idea the plane was shot down, and of course shit like a black hole opening up and sucking the plane in. Because as we all know, the perfect explanation for something happening that nobody would notice is a fucking black hole showing up within our atmosphere large enough to consume a plane. Yeah, no one's gonna notice that fucking happening. Of course, this is a heavily sensationalized event like with Lisa Lamb, with... Uh, honestly... With how recent it was, and the fact that over 200 people died, just like with Lamb, I think it's just maybe a bit over-sensationalized. This isn't some crazy thing for people to throw the conspiracies at. It's a tragedy. You, you get that. Grigory Rasputin, Rara Rasputin, lover of the Russian Queen, was a 19th century mystic monk of late Imperial Russia who had befriended Nicholas II, the last emperor of Russia. Now, a lot of claims exist around this guy that he was a healer, he was magical, he was a cult or whatever, he fucked a lot of women, and also that he was a prophet. What we do know, though, is that when old Nick was busy with this little thing called um, World War I, Rasputin got a good deal more influence over Russia in his absence, along with Nick's wife Alexandra. This didn't put them in good graces with the rest of the Russian government, and they decided to whack Rasputin. It was crazy, too. He was stabbed? That didn't work. He ate cakes and drank tea laced with cyanide? That didn't do jack shit. He asked for wine, which was also poison, drank three glasses, and was still just hunky-dory. He was shot, and that killed him, until they came back to see his body later in the day, and he jumped back up and ran. Finally, they shot him a bunch more times, wrapped up his body, and threw him off a bridge into the water, and that finally did him in. Man had more lives than the Spinosaurus has annual reconstruction revisions. Paleontology joke! Now, the reason I assume he's on here is because of all the stuff around his death and his mysticism. Man seemed to have one of the most elaborate and improbable series of events surrounding his death, and was just generally really unusual. As well as being a religious peasant who moved all the way up to being one of the most influential people in Russia, which you don't see happen often. Also, the mystery of how he knows who Wario is in Epic Rap Battles of History. Wario didn't show up until decades after he died. Amelia Earhart Amelia Earhart was a 19th century American aviator with quite a resume for the time. One of the first ever aviators to promote commercial air travel and a woman who broke a ton of records. She was the first woman to ever fly solo non-stop across the Atlantic and North America. And from what we know, she was like the perfect woman for a lot of the horny people in the Versus community. Not in that she was muscular, but in that she was a prototypical tomboy. Adventurous, willing to get her hands dirty, and always up to give everything a go. But this would eventually be a downfall when she would mysteriously disappear while attempting to become the first woman to ever circumnavigate the globe. The disappearance of Amelia Earhart is one of the most well-known disappearances from an individual of all time. Now, people don't always seem to be aware either, but she didn't disappear alone. She disappeared alongside her navigator, Fred Nguyen. Nguyen, Nguyen, Nguyen. Fucking hell. The two of them are flying until they eventually just vanished 100 miles off from Howland Island. We know nothing about what happened. They just vanished, with Amelia's last transmissions being about them being low on fuel before she vanished without trace. They've never been found, and naturally people have come up with many theories as to what happened. 
both the normal, boring, reasonable ones like they crashed or they were captured by Japan, and the bro awesome, ridiculous ones like that they flew into a black hole, or they randomly decided to just assume new identities and decide to do that by drawing a shitload of attention to themselves and always keeping in contact with Amelia's husband before they vanished. Because what you want to do when you're trying to disappear is to draw attention to yourself. Actually, with all we're about to talk about, maybe that is just the best way to do it. Anyway, Amelia Earhart was posthumously made into something of a legend, as she deserved. With countless awards given to her after her disappearance and her status as an icon of both female empowerment, and also an intriguing mystery that will go on for years to come. At least until we get the technology to just figure out what happened, which might happen any minute now, who fucking knows. Madeline McCain. Let me know if I'm pronouncing that one right too. Anyway, Madeline McCain was a three-year-old British girl who disappeared on the 3rd of May in 2007. During a holiday with her parents and siblings, Madeline was left alone with her two two-year-old siblings asleep in an apartment of the Praia da Luz Resort in Portugal at about 10.30, while her parents and their friends left to have dinner about 50 meters away. Her parents regularly checked up on their children until at around 11 p.m. where they found Madeline missing. This case blew up quickly, becoming what is regarded as the most heavily covered missing persons case in modern history, with investigations lasting all the way to 2022, with the most recent theory being that a piece of scum baby fucker was responsible. I really hope that's not true. There's a lot more to the case as well than what I just said. For instance, eyewitness accounts include a man carrying a child wearing pink at night, which was later believed to be an unrelated instance, and a completely different eyewitness account of a man spotted carrying a child around that time as well, who is not the same guy. The story is full of information, and unfortunately, it is believed that Madeline may be dead. Jimmy Hoffa James Riddle Hoffa sure lived up to his name. As an American labor leader, he is an incredibly controversial figure and president of the International Brotherhood of Teamsters. Now, as a leader, he helped make the IBT the largest by membership labor union in the United States, and even after going to prison for, let's say, criminal relations, he still refused to resign as president when in there. July 30th of 1975, Jimmy Hoffa would mysteriously disappear while at a Detroit restaurant while waiting for a meeting with Anthony Guy Clone, an alleged mafia kingpin. Well, he wasn't at the restaurant, rather, he was stood up and left the restaurant, called his wife to tell her he'd be home to cook dinner. He lied. Hoffa's disappearance would spark a lot of discussion and continue to this day as one of the most well known instances of someone disappearing. Surprisingly, this one seems relatively free of stupid theories about it. Most just sort of believe he was whacked by the mafia or something. Uh, yeah, man gone. Brian Schaefer. Brian Schaefer is yet another case of a mysterious disappearance. Brian was an American medical student of Ohio State University. March 31st of 2006, Brian was free from uni because of spring break and went to a place called the Ugly Tuna Saloon with a few mates, before suddenly, gone. He just vanished when he was left alone. Now, his mates didn't think much of this, apparently just ditching his friends was something he'd regularly do, but after the day had ended and Brian never showed back up, as well as never boarded a scheduled flight of his, he was declared missing. As expected, there was a pretty big search, with sightings and investigation of Brian going as far out as Sweden, and obviously we don't know much about what happened. This is a case where one strong theory is that Brian actually ran off and is currently living under a new identity, which of course is the optimistic view, but there's also theories that he either purposely or accidentally ended himself, and of course the classic cover-up theory. This case has even been associated with the smiley face killer, strangely, considering that guy doesn't exist. This case is rather sad, not just because obviously Brian is gone, but also the tragedy that surrounded his family. His father, Randy Schaefer, was found deceased in his yard, having never learnt what happened to his son after a tree branch fell and struck him the night before he was found. And now the only member of Brian's immediate family remaining is his brother, Derek. Derek has lost his mother to cancer, his father to an accident, and his brother to a disappearance. It's just a really sad case overall, and I really want to hope Brian is out there somewhere and one day might come back to his brother, but... I don't know, man. Nazca Lions. Oh, look, something that isn't a depressing disappearance. The Nazca Lions are a set of fucking massive geoglyphs in the Nazca Desert of southern Peru. These big fucking lions, while often just big lions, also have been known to depict animals as such, with 70 plus specifically animal based ones, and new ones continue to be found all the way to 2020. These lions are super mysterious because why are they here? How are they made? From the ground level, one couldn't even tell that they were making any shapes. It's believed that they hold some religious meaning, at least for the people who carved them into the soil, but there are a lot of theories as you'd expect about why exactly they're the way they are. For instance, aliens, obviously, because how else would they create carvings that are only visible from high in the air when all they had was themselves on the ground? Not to mention, uh, what the fuck does this guy represent, hmm? Now sure, you might be saying, well, the indigenous people just made small scale representations, and then they watched from a nearby hill to make sure it was carved right using ropes and strings to ensure accurate proportions to the Nazca carving. And to that I say, shut up, 
Cicada 3301. Cicada 3301 is one of the longest enduring and most well-known internet mysteries on the net. Beginning back in January 12 when this image was posted on 4chan, beginning one of the craziest hunts ever. Users were able to find the hidden message mentioned and trace that to a website, which led to coordinates that pointed to 14 locations in 5 separate countries. This is probably the point people started to realize this wasn't just some schmuck with too much free time in his hands, there was a lot of work put into this involving going to different countries in the world, which kind of nuts. So they get to these coordinates and there they find QR codes attached to cicadas for whatever reason. And then, well the private stage of the puzzle happened, which took the winners of the puzzle to the, well to the end of it. But that wasn't it, because after that, two more puzzles would come out as well, with the third puzzle, as of today, still not solved. We're pretty clueless, honestly, as to what Cicada 3301 is and was all about, with claims of it being a cult, or a government organization, or hackers, and so on. Who knows, for all we know, maybe it actually is just people with too much time on their hands, who live in different parts of the world, communicating through social media, who wanted to waste everyone's time. Cicadas are annoying like that. The Jersey Devil. The Jersey Devil is supposedly a devil that lives in New Jersey. Shocking, I know. Legend says that a woman while pregnant decided she would, for some reason, curse the baby to be a devil. Good job, lady. There must have been a tough shit to quack out on the birthday. Supposedly, it runs around the Pine Barrens, flapping its big wings and making loud, obnoxious noises, and was cited a lot in 1909. A popular figure of, well, popular culture, the devil makes its rounds, but people don't often bring up how, um, stupid it looks. The Kraken. Now, if this really counted as a cryptid, then I'd say this is also one of the most well-known cryptids. The Kraken is a legendary Nordic creature reported to be a big fuck-off sea monster octopus that kills people and sinks ships, first credited to Norwegian bishop Pontipiden? Now, while most people know it as Greek due to the Clash of the Titans films, it's not. See, in the myth, Perseus didn't kill Medusa to use her head to kill the Kraken or anything. He cut Medusa's head off because King Polydeuces wanted to fuck his mum. That's not a joke. He told Perseus to fuck off and kill Medusa, so while he was away, he could just ram his mother into the mattress. Perseus would later use Medusa's head to kill Atlas, who is not a sea creature when Atlas tried to attack him, and later he gave it to Athena, who placed it on her shield Aegis. The sea monster of Greek mythology is actually Skyla and her counterpart Charybdis, or even Cetus. The Kraken is really more cryptid-like, but it's also probably real. Not in the sense that yes, there is a giant octopus that sinks boats out there, but in the sense that it's probably just a result of some people on ships back in the day having seen a colossal or giant squid, of which can grow to 15 fucking meters long, and then they go to confuse with an octopus while they summarily shit their pants. That's really the gist of it. Chupacabra, or Goat Sucker, is a legendary creature encrypted from Puerto Rico and other parts of the Americas. Supposedly in 1975, a bunch of livestock were killed by the Vampire of Mocha, with small circular incisions on their necks and all the blood drained from the dead creatures. This spiraled further out with more dead animals until this legend came about, of a creature that is basically a vampire, but for animals it ain't humans. You might notice I haven't shown you an image of the chupacabra or even described its appearance, and that's because nobody can fucking decide what it looks like. It's either a big reptile fish man looking fucker or a dog without fur. Like, how do you, how do you get two completely different depictions like that? The second one especially is just weird, because like most sightings of this kind of chupacabra attribute it to being a dog with mange. As it stands, Chupacabra is at least pretty well known though. The Island of the Dolls, also known as La Isla de la Munecas, to people who don't know how to pronounce the actual name properly, is a Chinampa located to the south of Mexico City. You might notice, I, it's covered in dolls. The fuck's up with that? But it turns out the former owner of this island, Julian Santana Barrera, put them all around the place to ward off evil spirits, namely the spirit of a girl that supposedly drowned long ago. It's believed that his heart attack induced death was not just a heart attack, but the ghost of this girl coming to kill him, because he was near where she drowned. Or, or maybe, maybe, just maybe, he was a superstitious man who genuinely thought this would ward off a ghost and just died of a heart attack because people sometimes do that. It could just be that as well. Sleep paralysis. Sleep paralysis is a phenomenon where during the period where you're falling asleep or waking up, you're fully aware of your surroundings, but you can't move or talk. It's literally paralysis, directly after or directly before sleep. Often triggered as a result of sleep deprivation or stress, this phenomenon can lead to hallucinations and pissing your pants in fear. It's quite common and not that serious or bad, but when it's happening, it can be pretty frightening. After all, being awake but unable to move just is not a pleasant feeling. Of course, because we didn't always have the supernatural ability of common sense and rational thought, there were a ton of theories about what this was back in the day. 
Demonic possession, alien abduction, cryptid effects, ghosts, the night hag, magic curses, all the good shit, baby. At this point, you gotta just wonder what isn't the result of aliens or demons. Man, I took a hard shit this morning and the water splashed up and hit my ass. Must have been some demon living down there in my shitter. Polybius. Polybius is the 150th episode of the Angry Video Game Nerd web series about a haunted arcade machine. It's also an urban legend of an arcade machine that appeared in 1981 Portland, Oregon. An addictive and apparently very fun arcade game that Men in Black would often collect data from. Players would suffer symptoms as a result of playing the game, from seizures to amnesia to insomnia and so on, and then one day, it vanished. Now big surprise, it's a load of bullshit. This didn't really happen, or did it? Probably not. Tons of searches have gone on and found nothing to suggest it ever actually existed. After all, the US government would never do something like this to their citizens, would they? Yeah, the next entry is MK Ultra. Project MK Ultra was an illegal human experimentation program done by the CIA revolving around brainwashing and psychological torture. The project involved fucking with the brains of the subjects involved, messing with their brain functions and mental condition using most famously LSD, but also more than just that, like sensory deprivation and sexual abuse. This went on from 1953 to 1973, probably even further back if you count the preceding projects Artichoke and Bluebird. And most of the subjects did not consent. They were unwitting participants and included people in hospitals, prisons, and universities. Some information was declassified in 2001, and that's why we know so much about the program, but we still don't know everything, due to the fact that a lot of its records were destroyed and the still heavily classified nature of the program. It is heavily subject to so many conspiracy theories, and it's often used as an explanation for some other conspiracies as well, because of course it is. Annabelle the Doll Annabelle the Doll is a corporate icon of the Conjuring universe, a waste of space cinematic universe made of jump scares and badly produced films that unfortunately include two really good Conjuring movies in their midst. It is however based on a real thing, one of the Warren cases. Annabelle is an allegedly haunted Raggedy Ann doll that looks like this. Which I know might not seem as scary to some as the Conjuring universe one, but honestly this is an over-designed mess while well, this looks like something I wouldn't pay attention to if I saw it on the shelf, which uh, is probably more frightening in this context. Anyway, the story goes that this doll was given to a student nurse in 1970, wherein it started to behave weirdly, being malicious and evil, then the Warrens were called in, declared it possessed, and stuck it in a box. That's it. Yeah, there wasn't any crazy events like the fucking Annabelle trilogy might show, it's just a creepy doll that deserved to be nothing more than an unsettling opening to the first Conjuring. But for the sake of safety, I'm not going to make fun of it because the last thing I need at night is for Annabelle to jam a hairbrush up my ass while I'm asleep. Robert the Doll. Ah, oh, fuck, another one. Robert the Doll is frankly, a bit more interesting than Annabelle, but similar. Both are a haunted doll, but in the case of Robert, he was bought by Robert Eugene Otto's grandpa, who gave it to him, who got married, then died with his wife, then their house was bought, then sold, then turned into a guest house, then Robert was donated to a museum, and bada bing bada boom, that's where he is now. Supposedly, Robert is able to move and change expressions. He is fully aware of his surroundings and causes post-visit misfortunes from people who disrespected him during visits to the museum. So just to be safe, Robert is based. Blank Room Soup. Blank Room Soup refers to... Well, um, okay, so first off, there was a video uploaded to YouTube called Freaky Soup Guy. It's a video of a guy eating soup, and it's a big freaky. Everything checks out so far. The man can be seen eating his food while crying and whimpering while this pop vinyl looking fucker walks in and starts patting his back. And then, oh god, it's getting out of her hand, now there are two of them. What's really freaky about this is that I have the exact same bowl as that. This appeared in 2005 and was really creepy to some people who theorized that this man was tortured and forced to eat the remains of his wife. Got a new Funko into some weird shit. Another video would come out called Soup Torture, depicting the same thing. Except this time, the man gets fucking hip and shoulder by this fucker in Mark 10 and sent flying to the Bahamas. Anyway, what we know is that these fucking things are called Ray Rays. Character was made by Raymond S. Percy, who does look like he'd eat soup, but probably only from the sink. Was he responsible for this? Well, according to him, no. The suits were stolen and used to make this without his consent. Sure, man. Black holes. What do you want a fucking science lecture? A black hole is a big singularity in space that is so dense the gravity sucks in light and light can't escape. Ship goes in, it gets spaghettified, fucking big death zone in space. People use it to come up with theories that you can go in one side and get pooped out the other from a white hole into another dimension. Yeti. As I mentioned a bit back, the Yeti or Abominable Snowman is similar to Bigfoot, being a big fucking ape man living in the Himalayan mountains supposedly. It's really quite similar, down to the idea that most sightings amount to misidentified bears and the historical folklorish nature of them. What else am I supposed to say? Doppelganger. A doppelganger is an exact replica of you. A biologically unrelated but yet physically identical person to you who is somewhere around. Often described in mythology and folklore as some paranormal ghost thing or evil twin, doppelgangers can either be seen as a sign of bad luck or a sign of your impending death. 
I guess it's a good thing I don't have a doppelganger. Oh fuck. Easter Island. Easter Island is in fact not a giant egg where a big Australian rabbit voiced by Hugh Jackman lives. It's actually an island in the Pacific Ocean famous for its Moai statues. Ancient sculptures made by the Rapa Nui people when protected as a World Heritage Site. Obviously the big thing here are those heads. The big chunky Moai eyes, some being fucking just terribly huge. With most mystery being around how the people get there. And also about the heads. What do they do? What are they about? Why were they made? And the general culture of the people who made them. I don't really get what's so disturbing or weird here, but maybe it's just me. It's just a place where some indigenous people made heads. Don't you want to get some head? Stonehenge. Stonehenge is a bunch of sarsen rocks in England, about 25 tons each, in the form of two rings built around 3000 BC. It's believed that this was originally built as some sort of burial ground, but as we've established, we need the least logical reasoning here. The big question with Stonehenge is, as expected, how and why? How was it built? Obviously, moving these 25 ton stones would be impossible for primitive humans, except it wouldn't have been, we'd know of ways it could have been done, but it's impossible, you see. And why? Aliens, mate. Fucking aliens. That's also how to. It's the result of the fucking aliens. They took the rocks and they made a funny sculpture and the humans went, ooh. Atlantis. <sighs> Do I really need to explain Atlantis to you? Right, so, basically, Atlantis is a supposedly sunken island first mentioned in Plato's works, Timaeus and Critias, where it represents a douchebag enemy that attacks Athens. After being given a fat L, the gods tell the entire continent to just sit like a rock, and then it just... Well, it did that, and now it's expanded from those stories, becoming the de facto most famous and iconic example of a sunken city myth, with a ton of people believing it does exist, and people looking for it in the modern day Atlantic Ocean where it's supposedly sunk. Atlantis is a staple of pop culture, often represented as the classic civilization's technology becomes too good for them and they die off sort of thing, where they're super advanced technologically more so than even the modern day, and they fucking sink. But also, often people just keep surviving as like fish humans or some shit. Other examples of famous sunken city continents include Lemuria of the Indian Ocean, the motherland of Manamu, and of course, Brazil. Death Valley National Park Death Valley is a desert valley in Eastern California and one of the hottest places on Earth. What's so special about it? There's a ton of shit here. And I do mean a ton of shit in this valley, and most of it is in the National Park, which, confusingly, is a national park that includes Death Valley, but also Eureka Valley and Saline Valley. Stuff in here includes the Barker Ranch, the hideout of the Mansons, a cult of murderers, and apparently a golf course the devil uses. The land is full of people who have died here due to GPS malfunction, viruses, and volcanoes. People have gone missing, people have been mauled by animals, and it's fucking hot. Also, supposedly, there's an underground city down there as well. Place is wild. Don't hug me, I'm scared. It is not an order, it is a British web series about puppets learning lessons who go through all sorts of shit, when suddenly everything will turn dark at the end and morbid, with blood and gore and violent imagery sure to traumatize kids. I don't really know how to explain this beyond you can find videos all over the internet trying to rationalize what's going on, the themes behind it, what things mean, the timeline, so on. It's a series famous for those deep themes and also the surreal imagery, and also the fact that we're willing to call these two the red and yellow guy, but once we get to this one, we just call him the dark. A TV series of it is also releasing this year in September. Salad Fingers. Now, Salad Fingers is an in-joke turned to another creepy internet web series on YouTube and Newgrounds, famous for its... I mean, just look at it. It has a creepy art style and features this disgusting fella, Salad Fingers. Twelve episodes were released telling something of a story, but in such a way that, just like DHMAS, it's become a pretty popular series to theorize the meaning and story of. British people are weird is the main takeaway I get from these last two entries. I feel fantastic. I fucking don't watching these. I feel fantastic refers to this video of a... Well, just watch. Yeah, lovely. Now, naturally, this was pretty creepy, so people came up with all sorts of theories. <sighs> of course they did. The most popular one being that this was the creation of a serial killer who dressed up this android in the clothes of his victims, showing where they're buried in these shots. Or that this android is connected directly to someone that is being kidnapped, and the I Feel Fantastic is made to play from it whenever the kidnapped person screams for help. Sort of a twisted way for the serial killer to make the victims say what they want them to say. People really, really want this to be something like that, because I guess the lives of the victims would be of little consequence to them, and their lives are just that boring. Turns out, this android's name is, is, is Tara. Tara. Fuck. And she's a singing android made by John Bergeron, because he wanted to make a singing android. So in other words, this thing is literally exactly what it looks like. 
A singing android made to be a singing android that just happens to be creepy. What's scary if I'm being honest is that this thing is fucking 5 foot 10, making it at least 12 ribbit theaters tall. Dark matter. Dark matter is a hypothetical type of matter that makes up 83% of the universe. We know very little about it, we can't really prove it exists, but it's heavily believed to because there are some phenomena out there that can't be explained without the presence of dark matter. And also that galaxies would not be able to behave the way they do without a large amount of unseen matter. Oh yeah, dark matter isn't literally dark by the way, it's just invisible. I can't give much more detail than that, I'm not a fucking astrophysicist or any shit, just go read Wikipedia or whatever and leave me alone. The Voynich Manuscript. The Voynich Manuscript is an extremely mysterious codex that has been handwritten in the language... Oh, we don't know. The 15th century carbon dated book is extremely unusual as the language that the entire book is written in is just not known. Composed of 240 pages, the book is full of art, text and whatnot depicting various things real and fictitious. Obviously, being as this book is written entirely in an unknown language, there's a lot of mystery and intrigue behind it, what it's saying, what it's about, who made it. Is it a cipher, a cryptograph, a hoax? Could this be a language we don't know about, or is this some elaborate bunch of nonsense written for fun? Who knows? We haven't solved it yet, probably contains Obama's last name or something, huh? Robert Wadlow. I don't know why Robert is here, he's not really unsolved or that weird, he's just the tallest man we can ever prove to have lived. Standing at 8 foot 11 or 272 centimeters and weighing nearly 200 kilograms in weight, he was huge. He needed leg braces just to walk around, didn't feel anything in his feet, and unfortunately, he died at a tragically young 22 years old and was still growing even then. Chandra Bahadur Dangi. Oh, I guess we're just doing tallest and shortest people now. Chandra was the shortest known man ever known. With the cause of his dwarfism, actually at this case not being known, he stood at only 54.6 centimeters tall, or 1 foot 9 and a half. He died at the age of 75 for reasons that had never been officially disclosed. Zhang Jinlian. Zhang was the tallest woman ever known, standing at over 8 feet tall and born in the Hunan province of China. Her growth was shockingly similar to Wadlow's, but unfortunately she died even younger at the age of 17 for reasons that I couldn't find. Pauline Musters. As you might have expected, Pauline Musters was the shortest woman ever known, standing only 24 inches or 61 centimeters tall. She passed at the age of 19 from a combination of meningitis and pneumonia. Jeanne Carment. Jeanne was a French woman and the oldest known proven documented person to have ever lived, having lived for 122 years and 164 days. The only person ever to be documented as living for over 120 years. Of course, there has been some skepticism over her age, people believing maybe she's been confused with her daughter or something who unfortunately actually died before her. Jean would attract a lot of attention due to her age and people were willing to look into how she could be so old, all the way until the day she died where she was borderline blind and deaf, having spent a lot of her latest years with a simple daily routine that she abided to every day. Nobody knows the exact cause of her death either, at least it hasn't been disclosed. The saddest part of the story is that she was the last person in her family to be alive. Her daughter Yvonne died at the age of 36, her husband at age 73 of cherry poisoning, her brother died in 1962 at age 97, her son-in-law died the year after, and her grandson would die in a car accident the same year. I cannot imagine how it would have felt to be in her position watching everyone you love, including your next generation, pass on. Leaving you know until the day you die that your family is over. It's done. It just, it's heartbreaking to think about. Tarare. Tarade was a French showman who ate things, and I mean he really ate things. Tarade suffered from some condition that made it so even though he was described as very skinny and malnourished, he had an unusually large mouth and ate four times the rations of a single soldier during his time in the French army. He was skinny as hell, but he ate so much. He ate incredible amounts of food, but he could never quite satiate his hunger. He also would perform acts wherein he would eat anything. Treatment was attempted to be given to him, but it didn't work, and he was suspected of eating a 14-month-old child and nobody defended him, so he ran and died of diarrhea. Thanks for watching, everyone. Pripyat. Pripyat is a ghost city in northern Ukraine that was founded to serve the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. You might know where this is going. Naturally, after the Chernobyl disaster, the city was evacuated. I don't necessarily know why it's here. Maybe it's a stand-in for the Chernobyl disaster overall, or there's a mystery I couldn't find. The Max Headroom Incident. The Max Headroom Incident was a famous instance of a signal hijacking that took place on the night of November 22nd, 1987. 1987! During this incident, two stations in Chicago, Illinois were spared the pain of watching a news broadcast about sports by the sudden appearance of this lovely fella, a man dressed in a Max Headroom mask. Max Headroom, of course, being a fictional AI whose in-universe was meant to be like the first computer-generated TV host or some shit. This first hijacking, however, was lacking sound. So naturally, realizing they had fucked up, whoever did this decided to hijack the channel a second time during the airing of an episode of Doctor Who, this time with sound. 
This lovely chap claimed that he was better than Chuck Swirsky and then picked up a can of coke and said catch the wave in reference to Max Headroom being the coke spokesperson at the time. And then he got spanked for his troubles. This was naturally quite alarming and despite deep investigation we still haven't fucking found who did it. Oh there's suspects but nobody who've ever proved and nobody who's ever come out and admitted it. Me? I think someone was just goofing off and is also kinky enough to get their ass whipped on television. The most mysterious song on the internet. Yeah, that this is the most mysterious song on the internet. A strange new wave soft rock 1980s song recorded from an NDI broadcast that nobody knows the name or origin the creator of. It's tentatively referred to by Blind the Wind, and all we know is that a Brazilian team named Gabriel da Silva Vieira began looking for the origin of the song. At least this is when it had a huge resurgence, it had been brought up in 2007 beforehand, but we know nothing about the song still, nothing more than confirmation that there was there was broadcast that it was in, that's really it. I'm being honest, this song is a bit generic. There's also another song similar to this one, tentatively called The Fall of the King, here's the song. And uh, it sounds like a demo track for a band that really wants to be Black Sabbath or Kiss. The Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum heist. There was a heist of an art museum and the art was produced by Isabella Stewart Gardner. Back in 1990, 13 pieces of art were taken from the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum. And to this day, it remains unsolved, with hundreds of millions of dollars worth of art still not recovered and no thieves ever found and arrested. With the largest bounty ever offered by a private institution still up for grabs to anyone with information that could get the art back. At 10 million dollars? Jesus. Now there's obviously been plenty of theories often related to criminal organizations planning this heist, but I ain't gonna name names because I don't want to be whacked while taking a shit or something. What we know is that two men disguised as police officers were let in by one of the guards named Abath, thinking they were investigating a disturbance. Instead, they said that Abath looked similar to a man that they had a warrant to arrest and so they handcuffed him. Then when the only other night guard there showed up, they handcuffed him too, and then at that point revealed that they had bamboozled the guards and were actually thieves in disguise. Some real loop on the third shit. Then boom, they took the art over the span of an hour and ran off. Lots of things would come out after, dedicated to discussing this art theft. Understandably, as until 2019, it was the most expensive robbery of any museum ever. There have been discussions of this as recent as 2021 with a documentary named This is a Robbery, the World's Biggest Art Heist. The Catacombs of Paris. Hey, do you want to live above the tomb of 6 million dead people? Go to Paris, because below the ground of Paris is a big ass series of tunnels, including one part that is this catacombs, where a bunch of dead people are. I nearly said where a bunch of dead people live, and that wouldn't be right. Now that on its own wouldn't be the weird thing, but what's really weird is the famous Paris catacombs found footage. Now allegedly, this footage was found by a catacombs explorer and given to a French filmmaker named Francis Friedland. Supposedly, this footage is 40 minutes long and shows a man exploring the catacombs until he starts getting scared, runs widely, and just drops the camera running in the darkness. Now, Francis Friedland attempted to find this man, even going six miles into the catacombs, but they gave up because, frankly, it's not worth it. I mean, I wouldn't be judging through this for some guy whose biggest claim to fame is dropping his only light source while running through a fucking underground labyrinth. Do note that basically everyone here is breaking the law because it is illegal to go down to these catacombs outside of the places that are open for tourism purposes. Which, you know, I'm okay with. You know, good enough excuse for me not to have to bother going down there. JFK assassination conspiracies. Do I really have to? Okay. John F. Kennedy. He was a president of the United States. He got shot by Lee Harvey Oswald. People went crazy making conspiracy theories about it. Stuff about the CIA, cover-ups, multiple gunmen, conspirators who have backed up Oswald, the Illuminati, evidence fabrication and tampering, the New Orleans conspiracy, secret service conspiracies, criminal organization conspiracies. For all I know, people think that Bullet was fired by aliens in 3546 into a black hole, causing it to curve around time and space into the digital world, out into the real world, where it's split into several bullets, all of which gained sentience through flying through the demon lands of Mahatma, until they killed JFK because they really fucking hated Clone High. Oak Island Mystery Oak Island is a privately owned island on the south shore of Canada that is constantly the subject of theories about buried treasure and historical artifacts since the late 1970s. That's not right, 1700s, the late 1700s. It's believed to have the treasure and jewels of likes of Captain Kidd and Marie Antoinette, to even more believable and rational ideas like the Ark of the Covenant or the Holy Grail. And while there have been some interesting finds on the island, there's nothing even close to what people have thought is there. Even though the hunts for treasure have been going on for over 200 years, and six people have needlessly lost their lives doing so. Also, apparently, there's a big hole in the island, and of course, 
People think it's something special and it's probably just a sinkhole. Mermaid. Fucking... A mermaid is a mythological creature that has the top half of a sexy, hot woman and the lower half of a disgusting, fopping fish. The interesting thing about mermaids isn't, like, what they are, it's the origins of them. See, there are multiple places that we believe the Christian, European view of the mermaid from the medieval era are derived. Notably, there are the sirens of ancient Greek mythology, who despite originating as half bird, half woman, turned into half fish during the classical era in the late 3rd century BC. But even before that, at around youngest 14th century BC, the ancient Mesopotamians believed in creatures known as Kululu, which was an ancient monster who was half man, half fish, and later associated with Kulitu, which was a fish woman, and is the Syrian god of ancient antiquity times, Artagatus. Then around 1078 was built the Norman Chapel, which we believe to be the oldest surviving depiction of a mermaid in England, which then spiraled out into all of Europe into the modern mermaid that we have today who is supposed to be a piece of shit asshole who will drown you to death, but has instead become an icon of people who are down bad for fucking fish. Ghost sightings. We're really ending the first layer of this iceberg on something like ghost sightings? Look, you know what a ghost is. Jerry believed to have been a spirit of a dead person roaming around. People say they have seen them, there are shows about them, there are YouTube videos, there are top 15 videos narrated by chills, there's movies, TV shows, video games, board games, probably porn parodies if you're brave enough, shit's everywhere. I don't know if I can even give, like, a history lesson of, of like... Because, like, the thing is, the concept of a ghost is so nebulous and generic that during the millions of years of human history, predating Egyptian and Mesopotamian civilization, predating Aboriginal Australia, we probably still have had tons of believing about ghosts back in, like, the old days, like, back when we were fucking cavemen. Some ghosts love you, some ghosts hate you, some ghosts will curse you, some will do evil acts like skin your pets, fuck your wives, and turn your television on off at night at no discernible reason. Ghost sightings have included the 1995 documentary Casper, the 1992 completely legitimate live documentary Ghostwatch, any sighting of Nelson Mandela after his death in the 1980s, and of course everyone's favourite, this 2014 footage of a ghost in the house of an Essendon Bombers supporter. Truly scary stuff. And that's the first layer of this iceberg, and I realise now that I'm done with it, and looking at what's likely to come to like a 30 minute long video I have not edited yet, might even be 45 minutes, I don't know at this point, this is going to take fucking forever to get through. <laughs> Hopefully we're past the most boring stuff now, we can get to looking at some of the more interesting entries down lower in the iceberg. That's all from me, I gotta go do something like... Fuck a cactus, I don't know. But, people are gonna make conspiracy theories about it anyway. Hey, I hope you all enjoyed that video, and uh, thanks once again to all of my lovely patrons who are scrolling by on screen again. They're all the same ones from before, no one knew, so I'm not gonna name any names, cause... You can fucking see them. So, I'm... The first time I've done this stupid idea of asking people on my uh, a Patreon only Discord to give me stupid fucking quotes to say at the end of the video, so I'm not just reading the same names over and over again. Oh, uh, I'm looking at them now, and I regret my choice. Yummers! Todd scaling is objectively correct, and whoever disagrees is biased and knows less than I do. Hello there, I'm Nose is Bodreich. If you call Kitty, you curious in my face. You shake your hands so hard. And <sighs> now for the absolute best Family Guy cutaway! Alright, piss off.